we were just chit-chatting earlier about how it seems that people really want to get out and reconnect and see people in person now. And it really is, it really is lovely to see a group like this. And I thank you very much for the, the request for return engagement. Last time I was here last November, it was one table down the center. So this is really wonderful to see. Um, I am here to review the book. Horse, a novel by Geraldine Brooks. I think I've mentioned before, I have this recurring dream where I show up and I've reviewed the wrong book. <laughs> I just get blank stares back at me and I have to fill an hour. So, um, so I always make point <laughs> saying, yes, this is what I'm here for. Uh, this is my first experience with the writing of Geraldine Brooks. I, I must say, since I started doing book reviews a couple of years ago, I've done, I think this is my fourth, written by someone who used to be a journalist. And these are becoming my favorites. And I think I, I have an affinity for, for fiction writers who started out in journalism because they have a slightly different style. It's very comfortable to me because I spend my days reading printed nonfiction. And so I think there's some crossovers there. So I was very happy to get into her book and discover more about her. Um, as I always note, I try not to engage in any spoilers before I read a book for review, because what I really love about reading about literature is the process of discovery as you're going through the book and the surprises and what you learn about the characters and the phrasing and the new vocabulary you learn and the new worlds you learn about and that the characters inhabit and the emotions. So all of these are ruined, I think, by spoilers and reading reviews in advance or very detailed plot summaries and things like that. So I don't do any of that. I do all my research after I finish the book. And that's why um, some, some things come as this, a revelation to me after I've read the book. Oh, that makes sense now. That's why this author did this, or that's why this author chose this particular topic. So um, I would say this was not an easy book to read. Um, it's the third one in the past year that I've read that deals head on with elements of racism. Uh, one of the other ones was uh, Five Little Indians by Michelle Good, the Canadian uh, First Nations writer who wrote a, a book about residential schools. And I've read a, a couple of others actually with similar, similar themes. Um, the Accident, uh, The Personal Librarian, uh, which I will become, I'm going to be referencing here because I, there, I, I find a little bit of a crossover uh, with that book in a, in a key way. And just like with those books, I approached with some trepidation because it's so painful and the themes are so painful and the reckoning uh, for, for people who are not uh, a member of a racialized minority, I think is very sharp and very uncomfortable. I think it is something that we do have to go through and we do have to acknowledge, uh, but I did not exactly, you know, dance to the couch with the book going, oh, I'm going to start this, but it wasn't like that. I had to settle myself in, into reading it, but I am so happy that it was recommended by the club because I got a lot out of this book. Yes, there are parts of it that were very painful. Yes, they're, you know, coming to terms with the treatment of the enslaved uh, horsemen at that time in U.S. history, not, not easy. Thinking about the modern day repercussions that that modern timeline points out to us, not easy. Um, but I think that the, the portraits drawn, drawn of these characters really resonated with me. I thought she did uh, an excellent job. That is not a, a unanimous opinion, by the way, and I'm, that's one of the things I'm going to be discussing is uh, how she handled some of her characters. So just to uh, get to know our author a little, little bit, Geraldine Brooks, she was born in 1955, so she's in her late 60s now. She was born, not only did, did she have quite the globe-trotting journalism career herself, but she was born to a newspaper editor. Actually, her father was a big band uh, singer who got stranded in Australia uh, at one point when I think his manager absconded or something and he was stuck there. 
So we ended up staying and he met uh, Geraldine Brooks's mother who was working in PR for a radio station at the time. And that's how that couple met. Uh, Geraldine Brooks went to the University of Sydney. She grew up in Australia. She describes herself, by the way, as a, an Australian American author because she spends so much time in the States and she married an, an American as well. She was a reporter after graduation for the Sydney Morning Herald, which is a well-respected publication. And then she got a, a scholarship and did a master's at Columbia School of Journalism. That was in 1983. That is a big deal. Columbia's journalism program is extremely well-respected and to get a scholarship to do a master's there is, is really a primo. Uh, the next year she married a journalist uh, by the name of Tony Horowitz. He, he was an American and uh, she converted to Judaism. She, uh, both, she and her husband worked as foreign correspondents and as I said, globe trotted. She was a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal in Africa, the Middle East, and the Balkans. And those assignments as a reporter are not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, in my younger, more adventurous days, I might have thought briefly about <laughs> doing that type of war correspondence. But honestly, I, I don't think I had the the courage to go into war zones. And, uh, you know, we, we've lost Canadian reporters in war zones um, in modern times. So so certainly my hat's off to her for being adventurous and um, for not shying from difficult topics. Because if you look at Africa, the Middle East, and the Balkans, you're all talking there about societies that have been rent asunder by discrimination and racism, bigotry. So these these are subjects with which our author has been working either in a non-fiction basis or a fiction basis for uh, quite some time. Her, um, she started writing books in 1994 and she started with non-fiction. Her first novel, it was in 2001, Year of Wonders. It was a, a bestseller. So she really started off well with fiction out of the gate. And then in 2005, she published a book called March. It was another a uh, piece of historical fiction based on real life characters. And what she did is she made up a story that explained the absence of the father in Louisa May Alcott's book, Little Women. So here she had this real life family and her research didn't produce a whole lot about where the father was uh, at, at a key time in history. And so she ended up writing this fictional account and she won the Pulitzer Prize for that in 2006. So obviously critically acclaimed. This is a writer who was very well respected for her research, uh, for her historical research. So Horse comes along in 2022 which means that this is, uh, you know, just last year, we were uh, right in the midst of the, you know, George Floyd and post George Floyd reckoning in the US um, concerning police brutality uh, and treatment of American blacks. The horse became a New York Times bestseller. It won a couple of an awards, including the Indie Book Award for Fiction. And uh, she has given a few interviews, not a huge amount. When I was doing the inter my research afterwards, I, I didn't find all that many interviews about this book. I don't think it was as widely acclaimed as March. And I'm wondering if it's the subject matter and the fact that she chose to tackle it that maybe makes people a little reluctant to kind of dive right in. Um, I wanted to mention... Uh, that her husband died some, suddenly in 2019, and he was actually key to a lot of her research for this book, because he was the one who was really the Civil War buff. He was a historian as well as a journalist, and um, he was the one who brought her to an interest in that time period. She said in an interview that that she knew when she married him that he was really into that time period in U.S. history. And she had to try and find a way to kind of meet him on that subject so that they could spend time together to share their time together because they did a lot of travel in the U.S. South 
in order to do his research and then her research. So his loss in 2019, when she was just working on this book, I think would have been quite uh, devastating. She hasn't directly addressed it, but she did dedicate this book to him, the dedication for Tony. It will be the past and we'll live there together. And I, I wanted to research that quotation because um, after I found out that he had died when she was prepping this book, it really kind of stuck with me. So this is from a contemporary poet named Patrick Phillips from a poem of his published in 2015 called Heaven. It will be the past and we'll live there together, not as it was to live, but as it is remembered. It will be the past, we'll all go back together. Everyone we ever loved and lost and must remember, it will be the past and it will last forever. And that gives me goosebumps to think about her. So, such a lovely dedication to him and a tribute to him and his part in her life and uh, her family. Uh, I mentioned that the death was, um, the death was sudden. They have two sons. Uh, one of them named Nathaniel and the other named Bizu. He was adopted by the couple from uh, Addis Ababa, uh, from an Ethiopian uh, orphanage. And so I think for the whole family, the death of uh, Tony Horowitz was very, um, very uh, upsetting, very destabilizing. So as I mentioned, the couple had traveled extensively together in the US South for their research. And it was her husband who found a Civil War journal by the, the uh, chaplain in Thomas Scott's unit. Thomas Scott being the painter who ended up enlisting uh, and, and fighting and detailing their friendship. And we see parts of this come up in our story, in our, our plot. It's one of the many, many historical uh, tidbits that she weaves in, into this book. And the other thing that I was interested to learn about our author, Geraldine Scott, is that she does ride horses and she does own a horse, but she was not one of these kind of early horse crazy teenage girls. Uh, she only came to, to uh, horseback riding in her 50s. She says at a time when a lot of people thought she should know better than to be, try and ride a horse because it's, it can be a little bit hazardous. Uh, so she took it up in her 50s. She says she's not very good, but she does own a horse now. At uh, um, She has a property, I think, in Massachusetts. But it, I think that experience has informed her writing about horses. I should mention that back in the day when she was starting out as a journalist, she was assigned to cover the horse racing beat in Australia. So she, she knew a lot about horse racing, but I think the her knowledge of horses, her personal relationship with horses and understanding of horse character, if I can put it that way, I think that comes later. That comes in her in her um, in her 50s. The whole nuts and bolts of horse raising, that was early on in, in her reporting career. But this was different, becoming a horseback rider herself. So she has said about horses, they are exquisitely sensitive animals who can teach us a lot about ourselves, about group dynamics, and about leadership. Her horse uh, is quite, by horse standards, quite elderly. It's 26. Uh, and its name is Valentine, and Valentine volunteers uh, with a therapeutic riding program for autistic kids, and she's she's quite involved uh, quite involved in that. So that brings us to this book, the ninth book published by Geraldine Books, Horse and Novel. It came just after the publication of uh, Caleb's Crossing, and she tells the story about how she got. How, you know, where the nugget of the idea came from. She was on doing some publicity and some PR for Caleb's Crossing, and she was at a luncheon that was being held, and she sat at a table with an executive from the Smithsonian who talked about just having overseen the delivery of Lexington skeleton from Washington, D.C. to the International Museum of the Horse in Kentucky. 
And we have that occurring in our book. That was the little factual nugget that kind of sparked the notion that she could write a story about a horse and write a story about this time period and the horse in that time period. And she said she just became kind of instantly fascinated by this anecdote, that by this guy that she met at, at a luncheon, and that's what sparked her, her uh, interest. She also says she wanted to, to talk about this or wanted to go into this because in the 1850s, unlike most of well, probably Western society, really, uh, racetracks were integrated and they were um, spaces where to some degree or another, there was a, some integration of people of all colors and classes, classes particularly important in certain society, you know, the moneyed or the landed gentry, depending on what area you're talking about. And she came to realize that horse racing was huge at this time because the U.S. was really just um, one step removed from a completely agrarian society. So you had people who probably grew up with horses. They may be living in cities then, you know, they were living in cities, but they were not that far off the farm if they were off at all. And so there was a huge amount of contact with horses. And this craze for horse racing that grew up at that time was born of, born, uh, of that. And she found that really interesting too. Because what she realized is that as you know, she continued her research is all that success and the money made uh, in horse racing by uh, white horse owners, racetrack owners, and betters was all made in her, her, her words, built on the plundered labor of highly skilled black trainers, jockeys, and grooms. But what is uh, most known about them is distorted through a white lens. So, and I'm gonna get a little bit more deeply into this because um, there has been a lot of talk just in the past decade about this white lens and whether there is any legitimacy whatsoever to Caucasian authors writing about anyone of other races. Um, and, and it's been a very sharp debate in literary circles and sociological circles and academic circles. So I'm gonna circle around to that. Um, she also discovered that, you know, the central character, Jared, was featured in a real painting by the real painter, equine painter, Thomas Scott, but no biographical detail provided. So the author ended up having to base him on two better known black horsemen uh, <coughs> who were slaves at the time, a trainer named Ansel Williamson and a jockey trainer, Edward Brown. And she was researching uh, the historical aspects of the novel around the time of the George Floyd killing uh, and the white supremacist riots, you'll remember those in uh, Charlottesville. And she ended up coming to the conclusion, uh, I knew I could not deal with racism in the past and not address its loud and tragic echoes in the present. And that's one of the reasons she ended up uh, deciding to approach uh, or have several time frames in her book and not make it strictly a historical novel, but have a modern day or relatively modern day component. Now, she had done this before, so she wasn't a stranger to that format because it was uh, people of the book, her, her historical novel, that also had a modern story element, but I don't think is controversial. As 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 the the theme that she she chose. So just you know to put the fine point on it, we have these three uh, timelines that are interwoven. She calls it uh, a braided plot. I love that expression, a braided plot. Uh, the 1850s, which is where we have Jarrett and Jarrett's story told over just over two decades. The 1950s, where we have a couple of years with that uh, art dealer named Martha Jackson, and we have 2019, where we have Theo and Jess, and that, that spans about a year. And um, 
we can talk we can talk at the end about whether all of those all of those time references or all of those time elements were successfully executed. Uh, there's no consensus on that really. So just a very quick introduction of our characters. We have Jared, the enslaved horseman in Kentucky, born to Harry Lewis, uh, who is a free man, but his son is not. And that plays into one of the themes that really tugged at me, um, which was the precarity of the family for enslaved peoples uh, at that time. So the free man, Harry Lewis, ends up in this predicament as you know our story unfolds where he saved enough money to uh, free a person. And does he choose his son or does he choose his wife and having to do that? And what a, the dilemma that he's left uh, hanging on. We have uh, Darley, who later becomes Lexington, our famous racehorse, legendary racehorse. Uh, we have Jess and Theo in the modern day 19, uh, 2019 um, plot line, which is, you know, Jess is that the osteologist at the Smithsonian who finds the skeleton of Lexington in that dusty museum attic. She's uh, the Australian character, a transplant to the U.S., much as our author is a transplant to the U.S. She says a lot of Jess's upbringing in the story is very reminiscent of her upbringing in Australia. There's elements that she brought in there. We have Theo Northam. He's the, uh, the art history scholar who's uh, working on a dissertation uh, at Georgetown University, who finds that discarded painting in that pile of junk that his racist neighbor leaves at the foot of her driveway, you know, a free stuff pile. And he realizes he picks it up because he's interested in it. And, and his dissertation is dealing with the depictions of racialized people in British art uh, with his theory, which he eventually comes to modify, that um, they, were, they were treated like objects, like the other objects in the paintings, those paintings by British painters, and not as full-fledged people like the Caucasian subjects in the British uh, um, paintings. We have uh, Thomas J. Scott, the equine painter who seems so adept at uh, capturing horses, not so adept at capturing backgrounds all the time, or, you know, maybe people. At least he puts, um, puts Black characters, Black horsemen, into his paintings to tell the story about the horse. And then we meet some other uh, powerful white people, Richard Ten Brock, the unscrupulous uh, racetrack uh, and racing promoter. We meet the um, horse breeder, uh, Robert Alexander. We meet Martha Jackson. She's the uh, that art dealer, the gallery owner who discovers that her maid owns this very, very valuable, as it turns out, horse portrait of Lexington, who was the um, grand, great grandsire of her mother's horse, Royal Eclipse. And she eventually donates that painting to the uh, Smithsonian, which is why she's kind of mentioned because that painting comes around back at the end uh, and as our plot wraps up. So I want to dive into this question of race and whether there's legitimacy for white authors to talk about race just because. Um, this author has been, I, I mean, considering some of the debates I've read uh, in scholarly circles and in literature circles, I think critics were actually pretty light on Geraldine Brooks for her decision to write ma a main character, uh, a, a Black enslaved American main character, because there are plenty of people out there, some of them very learned people, and very powerful literary figures who believe she has no business writing a main character who is Black, because she simply cannot understand that reality. Um, the author said, as I began to research Lexington's life, it became clear to me that this novel could not merely be about a racehorse, it would also need to be about race. So this is um, kind of teeing up uh, the explanation for her decision to do this. And even back when she was prepping this book, it was a very, very hot controversy. 
to the point where she references that. I'll get to that in a minute. She references it in this book. She puts words into the, the mouth of, um, of Theo uh, to have him kind of embrace that, that notion as a character. So, for example, a review in The Guardian said about her decision, about that statement, I knew it couldn't just be about a race or it has to be about, about race. That's the kind of solemn and virtuous statement that can make a reader wary, that unmistakable whiff of good intentions. So some people were heading into this book already, I think, you know, locked and loaded for this author. No kidding. And when I came to, when I was looking at some of the reviews online, I was really on guard against that about people who were not going to review this book well, simply because they felt that Geraldine Brooks had no business writing it this way. Uh, Brooks has done this, as I've mentioned, this is not the first time that, that uh, Brooks has dealt with very difficult topics having to do with uh, bigotry and, uh, and racism. She's written across cultural and racial divides before in her book. She wrote about Islamic women, for example, in her book, Nine Parts of Desire. She wrote about an Aboriginal Harvard graduate in Caleb's Crossing. So she is not one to shy away from this. Um, she was, at the time, March was, was a little bit controversial kind of on this score as well, uh, because she was accused of populating it uh, because it was also uh, set at a very fraught racial time in US history. She was accused of populating it with slave saints and savants for a treacly and embarrassing result. And that was from a fellow writer. That wasn't a critic. That was a fellow writer named Thomas Mallon who said that about her. That what she did there was basically create these overly virtuous characters. And that implying that that's another form of racism is when a white author creates characters who are saintly uh, or especially uh, knowledgeable without having any negative traits. So, you know, I just think about that, uh, how uh, the very fine line that Geraldine Brooks would have had to walk to win over many, many people who think she had no business writing this, the very fine line between not fleshing out your character enough or fleshing out your character, but in too positive a light or fleshing out your character, indulging in racist tropes. So where exactly was she supposed to, it's almost as if there was no room for her to get it right. Her windows were so narrow, it, in my view, in the thinking of these, these uh, critics, that there's no way she could have written a book that would have satisfied the most ardent defenders of that notion that she had no business of writing about or writing a character uh, who was not uh, white at that time. Um, I, I, working as a journalist, and I, I get why she did it, uh, because if you come from a journalism background and you, you deal with stories coming out of places where there is no freedom of speech, you're not gonna let people tell you what you can and cannot write. When you've seen the result of oppression of freedom of speech, you've become very on guard about, about that. And I know that opinion is not, po not popular. A lot of journalists, a lot of journalists feel that there should be limits. A lot of uh, academics feel there should be limits on what can be said. Canada has laws about what can be said. I come down, I would be, uh, my, you know, in Trudy land, the freedom of speech question would be just a little tiny bit more liberal than Canadian law. Just a little bit more liberal than Canadian law. Not as open as the United States, which holds freedom of expre expression much more dearly, uh, but it would be a little bit more free than, than what we have, just because my fear is, is the, the wholesale repression of ideas. And so, 
I'm wondering if her journalism background did inform her decision to do this, to kind of thumb her nose and say, oh yeah, you think I can't do this? Well, I'm gonna do this. So what she does, and I think this is a direct challenge to the people who feel that way, that she that feel that she shouldn't have been writing about a black character, is she uh, mentions Frederick Douglass right in the plot. And this is something that uh, Theo, our, um, our black American academic uh, references. Um, very early on in the book, uh, I'll just flip over to it because I want to make sure I get it. So Theo is talking about uh, the reality of quotidian black life didn't merit description depiction. This is about the absence of, um, of blacks in represented in art. Um, <clears throat> his argument mirrored Frederick Douglass's caustic essay, arguing that no true portraits of Africans by white artists existed that white artists could not see past their own ingrained stereotypes of blackness. Douglas's piece published in The Liberator mocked the caricatures that white painters produce, the broad noses, the thick lips, and asked his readers to consider if they'd ever seen in life the actu an actual face that combined all these exaggerated features. But here was a painting that challenged his thesis. In particular, the man in the top hat, the traino, trainer, had been depicted possessing a dignified authority. He actually looked irritated with the artist who was interrupting his important work. He gazed boldly beyond the painting, meeting the eyes of the viewers with a challenging glare. Theo had never seen a painting depicting an enslaved person that emphasized his authority and agency this way. So I think that was Geraldine Brooks challenging the critics she knew were going to be coming for her. And I think that was also her acknowledging, yes, it is difficult to get past the stereotypes. It is difficult to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's, you know, some people say it's an impossible task. Some people say it's just a very difficult task. She was saying it's a task that I'm willing to take on. And I have a lot of respect for that. You may, you know, I think that what you have to understand, though, is that doesn't shield her from criticism. We should still be able to say, you know what, I don't think she did a good job portraying this aspect of the character, or I don't think she went as much in depth into the suffering of this character, or I don't think she did a good job talking about the emotional inner life on this aspect of freedom, for example. I think the freedom that, that I would like to give her that so many people would like to deny her is also extended to them to criticize her and to call her on her shortcomings. But what I would resist is this wholesale, well, this book is worthless because she shouldn't have written, written it in, you know, if you're, if you're gonna come after an author like this, you'd better have your ducks in a row in terms of your criticism. Because uh, I think this was a woman who approached her research seriously because she knew what she was getting into. She was wading hip deep into a very uh, controversial uh, topic. So, and, and she has actually, uh, she's had, she had talked about this in some of the interviews, she was challenged to justify why she decided to do this. So she said, I'm writing this at a time when there's a lot of discussion and dialogue about who has the right to tell the story. So I'm very aware of that discourse and of the responsibilities inherent in that. It could have, I could have written about the horse and the white owners, but that to me would be another unconscionable erasure of the contributions of the black horsemen. So I knew I was gonna have to go there. So I think that's our evidence that she did try to approach this with all the sincerity that she could muster both as someone working in fiction and as someone who cut her teeth in journalistic circles and who, who writes historic fiction and is renowned for her research. I think that's our indicator that she did try to do her very best with this story. And I think she's right. If she had written this book solely from the perspective of the white owners, 
This book would have been accused of being out and out racist from the get-go because it would did not acknowledge the contribution of all the, the black skill that was so important to the industry. So she was damned if she didn't, and she's damned in some quarters because she did. So what, what I'm urging and what you know I had to I struggled to do is to try and approach this book on the same level as you'd approach any piece of historical fiction. You know, you look at the intentions and yes, it's okay to judge whether she exceeded expectations or fell below expectations, but don't say that she didn't have a right to tell the story. On that responsibility, by the way, doing the work as best I could to get it right, I came to the conclusion that it was better to make the honest attempt than to leave the story untold. And also, I feel like any attempt at empathy, no matter how imperfect it might be, should not be despised because we need more attempts at empathy, not fewer. So I, you know, I think there she was trying to head off some of the criticism right there as well, saying, please understand, I came into this with, you know, yes, those whiff, that whiff of best intentions, whiff of good intentions. Was she overly sincere in her depiction of Jared? I guess that's a question. Uh, first, though, I want to talk about some of the, the key relationships um, in this story. And I think that a lot of pet owners can relate mm -hmm. to that very, very deep relationship between Jared and Lexington, that almost that unifying bond between them that started at birth, you know, with, with Jared, the enslaved horseman, the groom witnessing the birth of, uh, of Darley, later become Lexington. Um, and uh, and our author has talked about you know basing some of the her, you know her learnings about hor horses and horse psychology and horse ownership. She said I became obsessed with my horse, and we have a great relationship. So everything that I have experienced and that I feel about her, ha I have transferred to my character Jared, who is the groom of Lexington and cares for the horse. And that's what we see is that. It's beyond this bond. I think you could argue that that Lexington is Jarrett's family. Mm -hmm. You know, here's here's a guy who grew up, a boy who grew up without a mother and with a, an enslaved father. Luckily, he had that because many kids, uh, enslaved kids at that time, didn't even have that because their parents were sold away from them. It's the grooms who have the strongest bond, not the owners and not the jockeys, not the trainers, but the groom that's there to feed and brush and tend to the horse who really gets to know the horse. And that is something I didn't know about uh, Horsey Matters, is that it's really the grooms who have this deep relationship with the horse. And I think it's beautifully wrought in this in this book. You come, you come to understand, you know, when when Jarrett doesn't even want to leave Lexington's side when he's being transported on that barge, he ends up sleeping in that little stall. He often sleeps in the stall to calm the horse, to keep the horse on an even keel because you know there's a big race coming up. Or we see his dedication to this animal, this uh, you know almost um, uh, meeting of the minds type of type of relationship that I feel is to some degree a substitute for the, the, the ruptured family dynamic that uh, as an enslaved boy that Jarrett uh, grew up with. So that, that particular relationship really resonated with me. Another relationship that was rendered in this book that I felt really rang hollow to me and I didn't buy 100%, maybe only about 60%, now that I think about it, if I'm going to put a number on it, is the relationship between Jess, the osteologist at the Smithsonian, yeah. and Theo, the Black academic. The relationship that was born when Jess makes a racist assumption that this guy was stealing her bicycle, when in reality her bike was parked further down the, the rack, and it was his expensive bicycle that he was unlocking. So... I, I, the reason that I don't buy this relationship in the in our story is because Theo has so much baggage uh, because of the racism, the overt 
racism that he endured, as well as the more subtle stuff, like people assuming that uh, a black man running out for a jog is up to no good. He's probably running away from a burglary. You know, we had a real life case of a man being shot in the States because he was out jogging and some people thought he had just robbed a place and shot him in the street. So um, the, the, the extremely overt, the institutional racism, and then the, you know, the um, uh, microaggressions that he's endured. And he's got so much internally about this. I don't know whether our author was successful in showing how he overcame that to accept this self-admittedly racist woman in his life as a love match. I, I, you know, I understand why she wanted to build this relationship because she was intent on braiding the stories together, as she said, but I'm not, I'm not buying it. Um, you know, we, we learned that Theo quit. He was a highly accomplished polo player at his exclusive school in England. He had to quit because his own teammates would use racist taunts <clears throat> and call him terrible names, uh, and bully him. Um, he catches Jess in her kind of, you know, underlying racism several times. It wasn't just that, uh, you know, the, the bike thing. Uh, and she ends up admitting her prejudice. Um, he's studying stereotypes of Africans in British paintings. You know, he's, he's very, you know, he seems to me to have been cemented in mistrust of all whites. And so, I don't feel our author did a good enough job in making the jump, making the jump to a love relationship for, for these uh, two particular uh, characters. Uh, and it really, really did, you know, it's, I, I see, I see, and I understand his anger. He, he said at one point in the action, when he goes out for a jog, he always wears his Georgetown University shirt because um, a black man must dress defensively. How often kind of have we heard that in relation to all kinds of situations? Like, why did he have his hoodie up? Well, I guess because he has to dress defensively because he's a black man. Why, you know, why, uh, you know, uh, why didn't he identify himself? Uh, you know, we had a situation in the, in the States in New York City where a man was uh, told by police to halt and he took out his wallet to show his ID and they thought it was a gun and they shot him, uh, I don't know how many times, dead on, on a doorstep. So I understand where his anger and his mistrust come from. She builds that very well. I think that's effectively built from a literary perspective. It's the other part, that jump to a love interest that I feel is not. I want to touch on the theme of the precarity of the family because this really touched me, you know, uh, to, I, I, I say that when I had kids, I gave my heart away. You know, when I, my heart's not my own anymore. My, my heart beats for my kids. So if the kids aren't happy, I'm not happy. The kids are happy, I'm happy. Um, you know, and this notion that, that slaves at the time could have, have their parents sold away from them or the kids could be sold away at any time. And the and I think that's a major underpinning of our character, Jared, is he has to live with this impermanence of family. And maybe that's why he so desperately wants to stay with Lexington. He does not want this horse sold away. You know, at one point he tries to run away with Lexington to maintain that relationship. And I think that's because he's had so, he's endured so much pain and seen so much around him with families that have been broken by those racist uh, policies of slavery. And then he had the situation where his father had to choose which person to free, and the father chose the wife. And that must have been, you know, on one level, I think the action has our character accepting it. On the, on the other hand, I think what a wounding that must have been. What a terrible, terrible wounding. Uh, and our author has said, Geraldine Brooks has said, I'm trying to explore some of the incredible strains and tensions that would uh, that uh, would put on a family relationship to live in such a state of precarity. You know, when their their marriages aren't recognized, so you could be married in the eyes of your church if you were you were married uh, 
by uh, a black pastor in their th those eyes you're married but in the eyes of your owner you're not married i can sell your husband that's what that's what happens to jared's uh, girlfriend uh, may is her husband sold he eventually i thought that was so generous of him to send her away when her husband comes back you know he ends up being wounded he loses a limb in, in the fighting in the war and he ends up coming back and she, he he says go and i think that's because he understands this precarity of the family he sees her little boy robbie needing his dad and needing that stability of family and this is his chance to give a family stability that his family did not afford so uh, I just want to wrap up very briefly on this free, uh, on this um, notion of freedom, um, because Jarrett's quest all through this is to obtain agency over his life, to be able to say where he goes, who he works with, what animals he trains, uh, and so on. He chafes at his lack of agency. And at times, you know, he's put in this terrible predicament where he can't defend Lexington from exploitation. You know, when they want Lexington, for example, to race so soon after he's run, you know, really exert himself in his race, you know, and it's driven home to him that in the eyes of the law, he is no more free than this prize racehorse. You know, they're both valued in dollars is basically his reality. And all this book has this theme running through that, that um, Jarrett, it, Jarrett's quest is for freedom to be fully actualized as a fleshed out human being and not just an enslaved horseman. And uh, we see him going in the, in the chapter titles from Warfield's Jarrett to Ten Brock's Jarrett to Alexander's Jarrett, and then finally to Jarrett Lewis, his own man. And uh, I feel that the I th feel that theme was very well wrought in having him. Now he came to Canada. We know that our track record was not perfect, certainly not perfect when it came to uh, racism and discrimination. But it was a better home for Jarrett to exercise his freedom. And he talks about it at, uh, when he goes to see that painting, as we find out. He goes to see that painting. And he, he says... Uh, Canada is my home now. He says, let me tell you, I saw it the day I first crossed the border. I could vote there, you see, when I was still counted three-fifths of a man here. It's been some few years I've come back to Kentucky only for the horse, so now there is no further need. And he said that's going to be his last visit there. So yes, as checkered a past as Canada had, on questions of discrimination and racism on many fronts, including our First Nations people, as well as um, visible minorities, we could offer to this character some degree of freedom, an imperfect freedom, but a better freedom than what uh, at the time the US was offering. And so that concludes my remarks. It's, I know some of the things I've mentioned are controversial, please feel free to weigh in. Or talk about anything else that jumped out at you. One of the um, cities in Lexington. I'm sorry. Won the horse race this past year. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 As they're as they're saying, they were talking in some interviews about just how how uh, how much of an influence Lexington was on the entire industry that he's still breeding winners. Yeah. Or yeah. All obviously multi generations later, but his his DNA is in them. Yeah, no, it was the Preakness. Preakness. Was the Preakness. Question? Yeah. yeah. What do you think the difference would be if it was a black in the in the book? If it was a black author versus the white author. That's a good question. You know, I mentioned that that I, I read um, uh, the Personal Librarian there. The white author who conceived of the story ended up seeking out a black co-author. Yeah, yeah. So I think we may be seeing more of that. Yeah. I, I because it's such turbulent water to wade into if you're you're an author. How would the story have been different? 
I have no clue. I guess they would have portrayed the, the more she a racism more more strongly. Yeah, it could have been more more bluntly. Yeah. The the I think a lot of the racism here is we don't see, you know, the constant uttering of the N-word being so in your face. It's all more implied. It's all the it's all the subtext of not being free. And uh, but I mean it's just conjecture. I can't even put my kind of myself into the shoes of that that author to to wonder. Yeah. I like the book very much. Um, I uh, read it, I, I became very absorbed in it, and I think it was the writing um, that she, her journalist background gives her such a facility in telling a, a story, and, and she can move so quickly over so much territory that, uh, so uh, I think that was good. Um, about the structure, uh, I found that uh, a little clumsy, uh, the inclusion of the art and the science and the bone people, uh, I don't know if that added to the, um, to, to the story. Um, the, um, about the writing, her love of the horses came through them so well. I mean, there were pages where the boy was brushing him and you got to know <laughs> every part of the anatomy of the horse. And uh, so, uh, and I'm not a horse person, but I really found those past, those descriptions so good. Um, I don't think I'll look at a horse the same way <laughs> having written this book. <laughs> That's right. And, um, uh, the, uh, the last part, uh, the last question I wanted to ask is, uh, yes, she no wrote the book knowing that she would bring, it might bring criticism, um, but what's your opinion or others' opinion about, did she succeed with her Black characters? I felt she did. I felt that we got uh, a pretty good glimpse into the inner life of Jarrett. Uh, his father was not as well fleshed out, um, but Jared, I felt, I felt sh she did a good job bringing his inner life out. Um, but her writing is very, it, you know, in journalism we have this expression, uh, economy of words, and you're, she writes very, very, um, very sparely. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is just implied. She, she, do, she doesn't, you know, get into long descriptors. It's more implied by action. Was she successful? I I think so. I think she did a decent job. Yeah, you could nitpick maybe at some details. The the you know the mention of art. I read I read a story about how she discovered this connection between the art critic in the nineteen fifties and Jackson Pollock. You know the splatter painter and. The fact that that art gallery owner sold him the car that he ended up killing himself in, mm -hmm. and and you know the person writing said, "How could you not put that weird connection into a book? You had to." And I kind of I kind of understand when you're a journalist and you're doing research, it you you unearth a nugget and you think, "Oh, this is just so good. I gotta I gotta shoehorn this in somewhere." <laughs> but there there have been criticism that that was kind of like a a little, you know, a, a, a plot point that is secondary. I thought it was interesting. Though. Question. I, I was going to say, as you said, it was the braiding of the stories that sometimes it, it was confusing and a little bit irritating. But the relationship of the boy with the horse was really the stellar thought that is writing in that book, how she described that as fabulous. I think I think she did an excellent job. Yeah. One last question. I, uh, I, I'm a fast reader, but I felt like it was, it was a slow read for me, and I didn't love the way that it all wrapped up with Theo at the end. Oh, yeah. I felt like that was just thrown in, and it wasn't really developed. Well, like... we also have our, our Jess heading back to Australia. Yeah. I, I was... That kind of came as a surprise to me, leaving her 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 beloved work behind, but being so wounded by what had happened. I'm not sure. And one at the back. 
we recently noted again bond between horse and owner with the queen and the queen died. Yes. Right before she died, she shook hands with Theresa May. She was with the horses that week. Her daughter just was riding a horse to honor her mother when her brother became king. Well, the bond between horse and human is something that we, myself, as an urban person, I can't really fathom at a cat or something. <laughs> Well, there is also that aspect that when you're a horse rider, you're relying on this animal for your safety. Yeah. You know, you're not riding your, you know, your cat or your dog or. Yeah. 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 Yes. But there, there's so much weight given to the emphasis and importance of the horse over the black man. Mm -hmm. The horse is definitely more valuable and irreplaceable. Yes. And one black can replace another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Disposable. Both valued in dollars and one is worth more. Great. On behalf of all of us today, I want to thank you so much. You did not disappoint us when you did. It was a fantastic review. Um, you mentioned Geraldine's uh, background in journalism guided her so much in all her deep research. I must say, your research <laughs> was fantastic. You brought up so many Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm with you. Thank you very much. Hey, before we end, I, this is more for myself. I, if you would just uh, um, give a show of hands, I'm I'm curious how many people here who read Horse. Um, was this your the people for whom it was their first experience reading Geraldine books? Could you just show me? But I I'm. I, I have mostly read all of her books, and um, I think it's that this book was such a, a wonderful book and a wonderful introduction for everybody into Geraldine Brooks. And I would encourage people, if you, you know, um, when this book was brought to me, I said, well, I'm not, I love Geraldine Brooks, but it's, I'm not reading about that horse. And it won't be interesting. And then, of course, I read it. And so, I would encourage all of you to just Google her. And I mean, Trudy's given us such a wonderful introduction. Um, I would look into, I mean, we're all pretty avid readers. You know, a lot of you come back to our book review. And so I would encourage you um, to look, look more into Geraldine Brooks than what you can. And thank you. Can I ask you can you find a whole bunch of registered Black, 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 black,